Welcome to the Q1 Buckpo. I'm Tim Hart Habril. He's Mike Big Buck Hoffner. And you know, today we've got a lot of information for our viewers because people are out in the woods right now, Mike. And we thought we would talk about a variety of topics from uh, really winter planting and food plots uh, to the National Deer Alliance to the DNR talking about the winter impact on the deer herd and what you can expect out there. And we got Tony LaPratt talking about making sure that you use the right maneuvers. To yeah, get the big buck. Yeah, well, it, 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 always great topics that we have to cover. But you know what? We the other thing we didn't talk about is boy, weather can wreak ha havoc with your best hunting plans. And Tim and I had planned to go, and we got rained out the other day. Man, it was a pouring thunder, lightning, and so you got to work around the weather elements. All right, as well, well, this weekend we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> exactly right. And you give it a shot out there, and then when you get your deer, make sure you take it into one of the registration locations, or you can download the form online and send to us at uh, the Q1 Buck Poll. Stay with us. We got more coming up. Lots of information today on the Q1 Buck Poll. Country Smokehouse was started years ago by myself and Suzanne, and uh, we want to specialize in homemade, old-fashioned sausage and jerkies and things like that. People say it's a destination. They come out for the barbecue, they come out for the homemade sausages. Uh, a lot of organic people, natural people want to buy the product because they can't find it in the local stores. We are the largest processor in the state of Michigan. We invite all hunters to come in, bring your deer in, or just stop in and check us out so you can see yourself. I recommend you come to the Country Smokehouse because you'll never be disappointed. Trophy Class Real Estate specializes in listing and selling unique recreational hunting land and vacant land properties. Hi, I'm Dan Hoffman. We're the premier real estate brokerage firm for Cabela's Trophy Properties in Michigan. If you're looking to buy, we have great properties like this one. Here's a beautiful home with a large finished garage on 11 acres with 600 feet of riverfront on the Black River near South Haven, Michigan. A great hunting opportunity and Lake Michigan enjoyment. Call us today or go online to see all of our properties. When a hunter graduates from my new Super Whitetail Boot Camp, he will be in the top 1% of the deer hunters in the country. There's hundreds of little things people need to know to really have the ultimate property. I come in and show people how to put all the right pieces of the puzzle in that property. To hold deer, get more born on the property, make them come by the stands, keep them from the neighbors during daylight hours. I'm Tony LaPrat from Ultimate Land Management and I'm inviting you to our new Super Whitetail Boot Camp. Back here on the Q1 Buck Poll. Well, Big Buck, today I got a chance to talk to Larry Martz at the Battle Creek Farm Bureau, one of our longtime registration locations and uh, a great sponsor out there. He's going to talk about winter planning of food plots because, you know, you still could do something uh, or you can get your ground tested. But he's going to talk about, too, what other deer looking for this winter. Well, you know, number one, when they come off the rut season, uh, you know, you've got to have something for the deer to eat. I mean, they just can't, otherwise you're going to have a starvation problem. And that's a, you know, primarily a big problem in the Upper Peninsula, but down here in the southern parts of the states of Michigan, you know, our big ag belt, we got to have food out there to have them uh, make it through those tough winters, especially this past winter. So great idea. Here's my interview with Larry Martz at the Battle Creek Farm Bureau. We're now at the Battle Creek Farm Bureau in downtown Battle Creek. Larry March is with us. Larry, welcome to the Buck Pole. Hello, Jim. Hey, today we're going to talk about food plots. And for a lot of people out there, you know, we're coming into wintertime and they think, well, I planted my food plot in the spring, I let it go, uh, I don't need to do anything else. But really, we should be kind of managing and checking that food plot right now. Yeah, it's real important to be managing your food plot. First of all, you want to make sure your food plot did what you expected it to do. Uh, did it, did it bring the deer in that you were wanting? Did it bring in other wildlife? Um, you need to, you know, look at it. You know, was, if it didn't perform, why didn't it perform right? Mm -hmm. uh, did you make an error in planting? Uh, did you not do a soil test? Uh, didn't have the right fertilizer? 
you know, there's a lot of things to look at and a lot of things to kind of plan ahead for next year. Well, you talked about soil testing and, you know, we still have, um, you know, sort of good weather right now uh, before the, the big winter hits. Um, should I do some soil testing now to get ready for the spring? Ideal time, as long as the ground's not froze, you can go out and do soil testing. You can take uh, random samples down about four to six inches, uh, put all those samples into a bucket, take a, about a two cup sample out of that, bring that in. Even if the soil's wet, we'll let it dry out before we send it in. We'll get the results back and we start working on a plan for next year. Mm -hmm. And as you do um, check your, you know, your food plots, uh, really you're taking a look at, you know, are there deer eating it, are they browsing it, uh, what's going on in what area of your land, right? Right. And there's a lot of things to look at. Uh, for instance, uh, you may have uh, a brassica type mix out there and you're saying, well, the deer aren't feeding on it. You know, the stuff might be up about two foot high. Well, the thing is, is you want to get more sugar into that and they'll start feeding on that in January and February. They'll dig down through the snow after the leaves are gone, they'll eat the stems right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And the turnips, they'll actually be eating those right out of the ground when the ground's froze. Is there anything else that, can I, a, that I can add to my food plots uh, in the winter time uh, to help some of the deer feed on my land? Well, you need to be looking at uh, the last, last winter we had a real bad winter, you know. So you want to look at supplementing the feed, you know. Supplement with some some shell corn, some protein, some other minerals in that. Mm -hmm. you know, and then also make sure to follow the guidelines that the DNR have for you too. You want to make sure you're following those correctly. Yeah, exactly right. And you got to stay, you know, stay on the right side of the law, right? Right. <laughs> all right. And, and as we take a look at, um, you know, maybe we didn't get our food plot all set this year and we're going to, you know, make a plan for next year. Uh, we're really not making one big massive food plot. We're really kind of making a smorgasbord out smorgasbord. there. Smorgasbord. The deer like to, to feel safe, you know, so we usually re try to recommend to plant something that's going to be low that they're feeding on and then next to that plant something that's going to have some height to it. So that way they feel nice and secure in that area, they feel comfortable coming in there. And it also helps them uh, from predators, you know, they can get away from that small short area and get into the, the taller stuff. Mm -hmm. right. All right, so make sure that you are checking your food plots um, this fall and winter and uh, then make your plan for next year to have a successful season. And uh, we look forward to seeing a lot of bucks and does registered at the Battle Creek Farm Bureau. You we guys sure have been do. doing it for a long time. And uh, we look forward to having you back on the show here again. Okay. All right, Thank Larry. you, Jim. Thanks. All right, Larry Martz at the Battle Creek Farm Bureau in downtown Battle Creek. You're watching the Q1 Buck Pool. At Outfitters Taxidermy, I do high quality work at reasonable prices. We do it all at Outfitters Taxidermy from birds, small mammals, fish, deer, shoulder mounts, full body mounts. I pay attention to the details in the mount, like your eyes, the nose, and the way the horns are set. Make sure the measurement's all correct, just like it is when you brought it in. If you're not sure how to cape your deer, I can do it for you, show you how to do it, where to make cuts, where not to make cuts. When you shoot that buck of a lifetime, give me a call at Outfitters Taxidermy. Honey. Fishing, trapping, Frank's Sporting Goods in Morley. We got the biggest selection of trapping supplies in West Michigan um, and the experience to go along with it. So we can teach you how to do everything right here on the spot. Long guns and handguns for any application and expert service from someone who lives the outdoors. Don't forget, we got a great selection of ammo. You'll find it all at Frank's Sporting Goods in Morley. Stop in or call Frank's Sporting Goods in Morley for the best deals around. Hi, my name is Vic Havens and we invite you to stop here at Frank's Sporting Goods in Morley, Michigan. Coldwater Gun and Pawn, your concealed weapon headquarters. Buy, sell, trade. We do volume so you have selection with new guns arriving daily. Need ammo at the best prices around? Stop into Coldwater Gun and Pawn. Plus, we pay cash for guns or anything of value, including gold and silver, where we pay the highest prices in Southern Michigan. Plus, we have DVDs, guitars, gifts, and more. Long guns or handguns, come see our selection today at Coldwater Gun and Pawn. Well, we've got some bucks registered in the Q1 buck pool, and it's very simple to get registered. You can go online, download the form, or take your deer to any of our locations across the state. They'll take your picture, they'll measure the rack, and uh, get you scored for the buck pool. Yeah, you want to get it scored, you want to get it entered, because you want to win. And speaking exactly. of winning, here's some winning deer hunters that were successful this past week. Let's start out with Anthony Riney with a seven-pointer from Southeast Michigan, scoring 40. C.J. Renard from mid-Michigan brings in a nine-pointer, the score 38.125. And Travis Bodine from mid-Michigan's eight-pointer scores 37 and a half. 
the winner last year was unlike any other winner we've had. And a lot of people are like, well, what happened to the deer herd? Uh, were they frozen? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it was not a bad winter. It was a brutal winter. And I'm telling you what, I'm from the UP, the Western end, we're used to cold weather. I'll tell you what, this was something else this year. All right, I talked to Brent Rudolph from the DNR about the impact, and here's his answer. I'm now talking to Brent Rudolph. He's the deer and elk program manager for the DNR. Brent, welcome to the Q1 Buck Poll. Thanks for having me. All right, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about the harsh winter and the effects that it had on the deer herd out there. Uh, what does the DNR see? Well, you know, you can be a glass half empty or a glass half full person. Uh, you know, winter is always a lean time for deer. Um, this obviously was a much worse winter than mm -hmm. we typically have. So you could look at it as, well, winter's always rough on deer, and they have some ways to be able to get through that lean time of year, and maybe they'll be all right. Uh, or you can look at it as, man, winter's bad enough as it is, and this was a <laughs> wicked one. Well, um, do you have any type of uh, numbers? Do you have any type of estimation? Sure. Well, one, one of the things we do, we've got a couple different ways to get some insight. Um, first of all, we do a winter severity index every year. We've done it for many years where we track the winter conditions as they progress through time. And that clearly shows us, actually in all three of our regions, but especially in the Upper Peninsula, that yes, it was a tough winter. We don't need those numbers for most of you if you were out there right. at all to know that. Uh, we also have had an active research project in the Upper Peninsula. We call it our predator prey project. It's been monitoring deer and interactions with various predators. A lot of it's actually focused on fawn survival, but we do have some older deer that are fit, fitted with radio collars sure. okay. to track. And once again, we saw really high mortality rates from those deer. A lot of those deer died, um, you know, heading into uh, this winter and, okay. and and didn't make it on through. So we know that that's not. That's not telling us what happened everywhere. It doesn't mean all the deer that, you know, mm -hmm. in the Upper Peninsula died just because a large number of those did. Uh, but clearly the UP was the, the most extensively hit by those conditions. I was going to ask if there were the areas that were hit harder, obviously UP. Uh, down south, uh, was it not so bad then? Or? There's probably a couple of things. First of all, in the northern Lower Peninsula, we almost always have much more kind of variable conditions for a couple of reasons. First of all, the areas of, high, of worst uh, winter severity tend to be smaller. You don't have broad areas sure. like in the UP. They're their uh, accumulation of higher snowfall in these little high elevation spots and other things. And, you know, deer are able to leave those locations. It's not very far for them to be able to migrate out of and, and concentrate into areas that aren't quite as severe. Um, we also had, and this has really happened the last two years in a row, the winter conditions broke up a little earlier in the northern lower peninsula than in the UP. It's the early part and the late part of the winter that really decide whether deer are going to fare well or not. Um, and it lingered for quite a while before we had break up in the UP, but the northern lower saw things uh, break a little earlier. So there will be areas in the northern lower that will be affected, but it will be a little bit more variable. Um, now let's talk about uh, the effects. Uh, so we're coming off in a lot of different areas of the EHD that was right. out there. Okay, so you had that disease. Now you couple that with the uh, harsh winter that we had. I mean, what, what do you think hunters are going to see out there in the woods this year? Well, EHD has obviously been the biggest factor in southern Michigan. And um, even though we had a severe winter by all regards compared to what we're accustomed to in southern Michigan, uh, we don't feel there's going to be big impacts on deer numbers. What you'll probably see in the southern lower if you are in an area that had a big EHD outbreak, which was now two summers ago, mm -hmm. you may still be seeing lower than typical numbers from EHD, okay. not really necessarily because of winter. Uh, what's more likely to be seen elsewhere is you might notice that buck antler development, especially young bucks, is a little bit subpar to okay. what you'd expect. You might see body sizes, again, especially on younger deer being a little bit smaller because that was a tough season on them. It did put a little bit of extra stress mm -hmm. and strain on them. Those are more likely the ways you're going to see it uh, down in our lower part of the state than necessarily seeing any big impacts on numbers overall. So have you adjusted your antlerless quotas at all? Yeah, so we actually adjusted quotas in all three regions. The Upper Peninsula, we reduced them substantially, about 70%, I think, fewer antlerless licenses. We don't have any public land antlerless licenses. We have private land licenses that we made available in a small number mm -hmm. just in a few DMUs. The northern lower peninsula, many areas decreased. Some areas in the in the northern lower actually increased a little bit, but overall it was a decrease in that region. Um, and then in southern Michigan, yes, we also curbed licenses a little bit. In general, we've seen deer numbers uh, lower than they have been over the past decade or so. A lot of it's been our, our goal to try and reduce some numbers that we felt were too high in some areas. Uh, but we're just able in the southern region to be a little more conservative with the approach because, um, you know, in, in some places, especially those impacted by EHD and other things, we'd actually probably like to see deer numbers even be a little higher than they are. All right, so as we talk about this, um, how long do you think it'll take uh, for the herd to stabilize and kind of replenish? 
Well, in terms of looking at weather, winter weather impacts, a lot of it depends on what you can forecast. It's supposed to be future. cold this winter, yeah. too. <laughs> you know, when deer numbers come down, you know, that's one of the, again, the good opportunities is it leaves lots of extra resources and kind of elbow room for the deer that are left behind. Also, we also see in the Upper Peninsula, especially, it's the, uh, the hardier deer and the better habitat that do survive those conditions. So they can start to replenish, put, put a greater number of fawns out and so forth pretty, pretty soon after that. Um, but it'll depend on them getting a reprieve here you know another year or two to come um, on the question in southern michigan still a lot of people's minds on ehd you know we haven't seen uh we, we've had no none reported this summer right, we had right. just a few reported last summer uh, but we're actually monitoring it at one of our really severe outbreak sites we're going to monitor for the next five years uh, to see how long it seems to take for deer numbers to rebound because you know typically a deer hunter it doesn't matter at the region or even the county what's going on. It matters what's going on on the specific property where you hunt. Uh, typically, we don't monitor at that scale, and it's hard mm -hmm. to do that. We're trying to take that approach actually down here, uh, mostly just so we can advise hunters as to what to, to be prepared for and how to adjust their expectations or their activities, um, even though we, we're still going to have to, to manage really at a, at a bigger scale. So it'll be just an interesting deer season. We'll see what happens. Yeah, really. I know in my uh, neck of the woods in the Quincy area, I'm seeing more fawns. Uh, we've got deer running through the yards, kind of all over the place at the moment. And hopefully that's a, a good indication of what we're going to have this fall. Yeah, I mean, certainly the one thing you mentioned in the yards we have seen, and in, in meaning residential yards, oh, yeah. <laughs> one of the things we have seen is still continued growth in a lot of the more suburban areas. And more and more places are looking at opportunities to actually bring hunting in there. Um, some communities don't even realize that you still can hunt, probably not with a firearm, but maybe right. with bow, bow uh, gear, and they're trying to help educate their own landowners. So I think that'll be another interesting thing in years to come is looking at those growing opportunities. Brent, thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot. Brent Rudolph with the DNR update here on the Q1 Buck Poll. I'm Tim Hart Haber. We'll have more coming up. Stay with us. You're watching the Q1 Buck Poll. Did you know that Tire City is more than just tires? Marshall Tire, Albion Tire, and Charlotte Tire are all more than just tires at great prices. We're your complete auto repair center. We're brakes, oil changes, steering and suspension, diagnostics, we're more than just tires. We're your complete auto repair facility. Tire City, Marshall, Albion, and Charlotte. Everything for the sportsman. DNR Sports Center. For the hunter, tree stands, bows, guns, and gear. All the top brands. Right here at DNR Sports Center. For the fishermen, check out the huge selection of boats, marine supplies, and tackle. DNR Sports Center. Full service mechanic for boats, guns, and bows. One stop shopping, a huge selection, and the best service around. Come see for yourself and experience the personal service at DNR Sports Center. Everything for the sportsman. The great outdoors has a lot to offer, and if you're ready to experience it on the next level, Greenstone can help you get it done. We finance acreage of nearly any size, from a hunter's haven to adventurous trails, or even that relaxing place on the lake. Greenstone's loan options make owning land affordable, with terms up to 30 years. And with 36 locations in Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin, we're just a short drive away. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. Greenstone Farm Credit Services. We finance the great outdoors. Well, it's always great to talk to the DNR, Brent Rudolph, last segment. Uh, you know, really good information, and it'll be interesting to see. We are seeing more deer in our area, which is the southern lower Michigan, than uh, I have for the last two years. You know, Mother Nature does some real interesting things. We've come off of EHD, then to probably the one of the most brutal winters we've had in quite a long time. But guess what? I've been out in the woods, out and about. I am seeing deer. That's a good thing, because I'm going awesome. with you. <laughs> All right, we got some bucks here to feature today. All right, let's start out in mid-Michigans with Garrett Rosich's nine-pointer. The score was 40.875. And Morgan Bresson from Southwest Michigan brings in a five-pointer with a score of 22. We always like to bring you a lot of information, and today we've got Tony LaPratt with us from Ultimate Land Management and the Whitetail Boot Camp. And there's so many different facets to going out and hunting and being successful, from your food plots to, you know, the rut, to the pre-rut, the post-rut, and there's a lot of different factors, and we got Tony talking about a lot of different aspects today. You know, it's really interesting because I think a lot of people, if you don't pay attention to the details and you haven't hunted for a long time, they think you just go out, set up, and you shoot a deer. Boy, preparation time of year, 
food plots, weather conditions, wind conditions. There's so many variables that come into harvesting a big buck and Tony's got it down. What I'd like to talk about today is what type of hunting land you have. So I made an example of four properties, A, B, C, and D, and each one has pluses and minuses. Then the other thing we need to discuss is the four stages of the rut and you need to know how the deer are changing about every 10 days through the hunting season so you can be where the deer are at at the right time. And this is another issue that a lot of people don't understand what the deer are doing and I'm going to try to help correct some of that. So here, what period of the rut is your stand for? You need to understand your land and what the deer are doing and here it is. We're going to talk about the pre-rut first but I want to show you four examples of property. Here we have farm A, B, C, and D. Now guys we're going to start with farm D. Farm D is nothing more than a couple of fence rows and a pothole. A little swell in the field. Farm C has a cornfield, has a little ditch running through it, a couple of doe units, and basically the woods is more park effect. You can see basically through it, and it has a couple little thick spots. This is where some does would bed. Now when the corn is standing, the red dot means bucks. So you could probably have a buck bedded there when there's a cornfield. The woods, in my opinion, would not hold any quality buck because it ain't enough cover. Farm B has a big alfalfa field and a pothole out in the middle, nice little swell. It has a couple of doe bedding areas the creek runs through this the woods is split up in an l shape and this woods is a lot more thicker it is not real thick but it has a lot more dense cover so a lot better than farm c now farm a really has everything heavy fence rows multiple crops it has a big swamp with islands in it it has a very thick woods very dense you can't see more than 40 50 yards and this thing will hold a lot of bucks and mature bucks. So when the cornfields are up, your good chances are your buck is bedding in the cornfield when the cornfield's standing. They love corn because it, it hides them good. Then when the cornfield gets harvested, the buck will probably move up on the oak ridge. This is a big oak ridge up here. And he'll get himself elevated so he can see. Of course, acorns are dropping. He's going to love all that. He's close to his food source. And then this one is when pressure comes, he's going to move back to his hardcore bedding area in the swamp back into the cattails and the little islands where no one can find him. Now, let's discuss the four stages of the rut so you understand which farm to hunt at what time. Now, during the pre-rut, we're talking when the buck sheds his velvet to roughly October 15th, approximately. Now, on farm A, this buck would probably be in the cornfield, and this would be his thing. He'd swing up, eat a little beans maybe, get his acorns, swing down to the alfalfa at night, and he's going to be in a very short pattern at this time of year. And so basically, farm A and farm B, you would have a good chance of harvesting this buck. But farm C and D, I would not waste one minute of my time setting in them stands because I know the buck is across the street. This is a dirt road. Now he ain't gonna cross it. No houses are on this setup. Okay now let me explain something. Guys like me and other successful whitetail hunters that I know across the country like a Miles Keller. We all look at deer hunting in many different ways but the one thing that all of us have in common is none of us set in 10% stands. We make sure that we're within the 90% of where that buck is moving. So guys, farm C and D is out of the question in the first part of the season. I would only hunt farm A or B, okay? Now, let's look at what's going on during the pre-rut. One of the biggest mistakes as a hunter is one step behind. He forgets that acorns are dropping, beans fields are drying up, and the deer don't want them. And then the other problem is, you got all this foliage starting to drop, you got people harvesting crops, you got hunters entering the woods, squirrel hunters, small games, deer hunters are putting up their stands, and this buck is going through a lot of changes. And this makes a lot of deer a little more tougher at this time. To hunt now predictable pattern he is still in a moderate bedding area and it's close to his food source like we explained very close now a lot of times this goes into a whole bunch another ball game of understanding deer but normally this is not his core area now on the example we're using today it is his core area but most of the time a buck beds in the summertime will you see the big bachelor groups that ain't where the buck's going to hang out that fall Okay, it's another whole thing of understanding does and bucks, and we'll get into that maybe in another episode. Now, the pre-rut again. Bucks, look at rubs and scrapes at this time. Approximately from September.
September 16th through the 30th, only about 8% of the rubs are made at this time. Now, from October 1st through the 15th, only about 17% of the rubs are made. It's just a flat line. When the buck sheds his velvet, everything starts to climb. You want to make sure you have water on the property because at this time it's still very warm and deer need to drink. And the other thing is you want to make sure you're staying some close, close to the staging area where he's entering out of thick cover or out of that oak ridge or cornfield and he's staging up before he goes out into some other food sources. Signs at this time you're going to need to understand rubs, tracks, droppings, all these tell you a story about a big buck. What way he's traveling his age, etc. All can be told by signs. You must keep the buck from going on high alert. Remember when we we're talking about inner and exit, biggest common mistakes. And here's what happens when you pressure a buck too much. Most of the time, it's the hunter himself that's basically pressuring the deer. Guys, I'm a guy that just gets a little time to sit and explain a few things. But most of the time, the hunters think the neighbors are all the problem. Guys, if you're doing everything right, where should all the deer be on your property? Most of the time, a hunter's doing things he doesn't realize. And so, inner and exit is very important. But here's what happens. Once you put a buck on high alert, he has about a 90% chance of making it through the season. Or you only have about a 10% chance of harvest him. You make him go nocturnal, so he's only moving the last 15, 20 minutes, he's got about a 95% chance of making it through the season. And then if you make him actually leave the property because there's so much scent and hunting pressure, he moves out, that buck has about a 99% chance of not being taken by you. So guys, you need to keep these deer calm on your property and don't let them know they're being hunted. Add style to your bedroom or living room with log furniture from Thurston's Furniture. One of a kind log bedroom sets, dressers, mirrors, easy beds that convert from a couch to a bed. Specializing in custom orders, Thurston's offers a great selection to choose from. Plus check out our Northwoods wildlife print area rugs. Want a camo recliner? You'll find it at Thurston's. Thurston's Furniture on M60 in Homer. Everything you want in log furnishings at great prices. If you got questions, we've got answers here on the Q1 Buck Poll. One of the ways that you can communicate with us is through Facebook. Uh, the DNR said, uh, you know, we got a post there that says, what are some of the questions that you would like answered by the DNR? And you can email them to me. You can put them on our website. You can put them on the Facebook page for us. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to interact and communicate. And, you know, sometimes people are not always comfortable asking, hey, man, you're hunting with, I want to ask this question. Like, what? So this is a good way to get your questions answered. Well, technology's made things a lot simpler for folks. So get online and get those questions answered. And also get your deer registered. Buck or doe, you've got a chance to win that Yamaha Grizzly 350 ATV. We've got muzzle loaders from Connecticut Valley Arms. We've got lots of things. And I will announce that we are going to have our final party at the Back Road Saloon in Marshall, one of the premier country dance facilities uh, in the state of Michigan. It's going to be an awesome night. And that's going to be the first weekend of March. We're going to have a country western theme, buddy. Afterwards, shoot him up. <laughs> afterwards, we're going to have a band and everything. We're going to have awesome. a great time. So put that on your calendar. All right, he's Mike Big Buck Hoffner. I'm Tim Hart Habril. Thanks for being with us here on today's Q1 Buck Poll. Remember, whenever you're out in the woods, be safe. Great country for Kalamazoo. Find us on your radio at 102.5, online at greatcountry1025.com, and on your mobile device on iHeartRadio. Kalamazoo's Great Country 1025, powered by Nash.